prepared to come and bring you a lesson that's on my heart today of 1 Kings 19, 1 and 2. We've now moved our way into the 19th chapter, and we're looking at verses 1 and 2. So here we are. From last week, you'll recall that uh, we have a second miracle on Mount Carmel. The second miracle, of course, the first miracle was God sent fire from heaven, burnt the offering, and won the contest. <clears throat> Winner take all. The second miracle was they, after, they went back up on top of the mountain and God sent the heavy rain showers. I mean, the word in the Hebrew is heavy. The word heavy means, it means um, mighty. I think the King James called it abundant. I mean, they got a soaking. <laughs> they got a soaking. That wind drove that off the Mediterranean Sea. And they dropped a ton of water. <clears throat> and Elijah, he, remember, he kept sending a servant back and forth seven times to look to the sea and see, tell me what you see. And he finally said, I see a cloud coming, a dark cloud coming, the size of a man's hand. Elijah says, you better run and tell the king he better get in his chariot and run like crazy because this is going to be a storm that could well flood and run that chariot off the road <laughs> type of thing. And so he did. And our story picks up as <clears throat> King Ahab returns to his resort palace at Jezreel. That was his resort palace. <clears throat> it wasn't, quote, the White House. Uh, that would have been in Samaria. <clears throat> but this was his resort palace uh, with Jezebel. <clears throat> and he, you'll notice that my lesson title is Ahab, the king Ahab reports to Jezebel. <clears throat> Which is kind of interesting and shows a lot of problems in their marriage and in the nation. Well, we recall that the rain was a wonderful thing because it showed the drought was over, three and a half years of drought. I mean, you, can you imagine how that affected an economy that was based on, on agriculture? I mean, just look, look at ours, and we, you know, three and a half years. <clears throat> well, this rain was the solution to the whole problem. And what it was, <clears throat> it was this. It was a sign that the, the drought was to bring a spiritual awakening in the nation of Israel to move them away from idolatry and back to their rightful place in worship of God. In order to do that, the spiritual awakening has got to lead to a, a spiritual reformation to make those changes. It's going to have to come from the top leadership, and that was really involved three guys the king, the prophet, and Obadiah, who was a statesman with, with the tribal leaders. So they had to have it all. You had to have the executive branch. You had to have the, the people's branch. And you had to have the God branch in order for a reformation to work. And all the pieces were together except for Ahab. Ahab saw a clear victory. God, without any without any debate, won the contest on Mount Carmel, hands down. And it was a winner-take-all. Well, Ahab's on his way home to report to Jezebel that uh, 850 of her prophets have been slain. And I'm sure that was not going to be an easy exercise for him because he hasn't got the leadership ability for it to be an easy task. You know, he doesn't have the leadership ability. Now, here's what's interesting about the drought, and I can see it in our own nation with the virus. People don't understand it, therefore they try to figure it out. Negative volition goes one way and positive volition goes another way. 
for people with positive volition to the plan of God, then they, they understand the drought was to bring a spiritual awakening by God for a reformation, a, a real change in the na national structure of idolatry back to the worship of God. And so when he sent the rain, he had shown that, that there was enough positive volition in spiritual awakening to do a reformation. And so he removed the drought and began to send showers of blessings. Which you see, if you have positive volition, you see it in a positive way. You understand what I just said. But you see, if you have negative volition towards God and his plan, then you just see the rain as more trouble. Right? Now we got to deal with floodwaters. Now we got to deal with rain. Isn't it enough we had to deal with drought? Now we deal with rain. Because negative volition is never happy with anything. Never happy with anything. Oh, if I had a better job, gets one, he's not happy. If I had a better marriage, he goes, gets another, not happy. Negative volition, there's no happiness that is derived from negative volition. And so we have this in the nation of Israel. We have positive volition. We have negative volition. And the problem is on the executive of the reform, the three guys that are involved that God has selected for lead the reformation, two of them are positive and one is negative. The king is negative. And when God wanted all out there, the king did not accept that. That should have been a no-brainer, as we say in Michigan. That should have been a no-brainer. So Elijah sends his servant to warn uh, Ahab to head for home. <clears throat> and, of course, he does. And our passage, 19, 1 and 2. Now Ahab told Jezebel, night, chapter 19, 1 and 2. Ahab told Jezebel that we're told to be interesting. I'll tell you in a moment. Nagar told uh, Jezebel all that Elijah had done. Now, it would have been nice if he had told her all that God had done. Wouldn't that have been a good one? But see, negative volition don't talk that way. Negative volition, negative volition doesn't see all that God has done at Mount Carmel. Negative volition sees all that Elijah's done. See, Elijah, Elijah didn't do anything except kill a bunch of prophets. God sent the fire. Elijah didn't start the fire. He didn't have magic matches. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he'd killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah. The message read, So may the gods do to me that, shouldn't, that was a no threat, right? Are there, are there such things as gods in the reality of the plan of God? Are there, are there such things? No. It's Satan with, dem with demons. There's no such thing as gods with a little g. You should read Paul's writing of 1 Corinthians where he gets all over it like in chapter 10. There's no such thing. Does Elijah know it? Yeah. So why would you even be threatened when she says, I'm going to bring the gods against you? Well, they better do a better job than they did at Carmel. <laughs> because all your boys cut themselves up and bled all over the place and nothing happened. Have, that's a message I'd have sent back. Well, bring them on, honey. Just bring them on. Because that's nobody. There's no such thing as gods. We proved it at Mount Carmel. We'll prove it at Jezreel. We'll prove it all over the world if you want to take it up. See, what's in a threat depends on your fear level. What's in a threat depends on your fear level. Is this a threat? Should this, is it a threat? Yeah. Should it have any effect on Elijah? I'm going to bring the gods after you. Well, they better be better than the ones that showed up at Carmel. 
What you should do is you should believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day. You should get saved and enjoy what God is about, the prosperity that God is about to bring to your nation through the worship of the only God of the earth, the creator God. None of this man-made religion stuff. <laughs> she writes, so may the gods do to me and even more if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. <laughs> Boy, you talk about... Look at it. A first grader in the Word of God could figure that was a bunch of baloney. That's, that's a threat you can't take to the bank. <laughs> but boy, Elijah did. <laughs> if you think he was fast running from the mountain, you ain't seen nothing yet. He ran off that mountain and beat the chariot to Jezreel. You ain't seen nothing yet. My, my, my. Let us not be that. You see, what, did, what was Ahab doing? You see, my lesson today is more about Ahab than it is about Elijah. What was Ahab, Ahab doing with his wife? He told her what she wanted to hear, not what she needed to hear. See, Mark Carmel was, 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 not, Carmel was not about Elijah. It was about the Lord God of Israel. And what he should have told her is how God won the victory at Carmel. He should have told her the truth. And been a man about it. But he don't wear the pants in that family. He wears the skirt. You know, whoever wears the pants, the other one wears the skirt. You do know that, don't you? Be a man. I'm not talking about muscle. I'm talking about spiritual. Spiritual. What he should have told her was the absolute truth. He should have told her how, what, what a miracle God did, how her prophets didn't, weren't able to perform. How, but he didn't. He told her what she wanted to hear, like so many men. Listen, your wife needs the truth. You can do it gently. You can do it honorably. You can do it respectfully. But she still needs the truth of the word of God. There's my lesson for you. He should have opened the Bible and read her. Listen to me. He should have opened the Bible and read her, read her what we teach our kids downstairs in preschool. He should, have, he should have taught her about God in Exodus, the 20th chapter. How the Ten Commandments, how one side is all about God and that he's a jealous God. And then he should have read her, uh, read to her Exodus 34, somewhere around 14, 17, somewhere in there, where God calls, it says God's name is jealousy. I don't know if any of that's on your paper or not. It should be. Or Joshua, here's a great one, Joshua 24, 14, and 15, the, the, which is a leadership passage. If, I mean, these are, these are so elementary in Israel. The Ten Commandments. Exodus 34, where God declares himself by name. I'm not just a jealous God, call me jealous. And Joshua uses this idea 
in leadership role in Joshua in a very famous passage, Joshua 24, 14, and 15. As for my house, she should read the whole thing. So today's lesson, I'm going to focus more upon Ahab's marriage than Elijah's life. I've got four aspects of Ahab reporting to Jezebel what happened at Mount Carmel and her reaction to his report. You see, if he'd have gave her the truth, then we could have said, listen, negative volition worked with negative volition, so negative volition came out. If he would have carried positive volition, then she would have had to make a decision between negative and positive, right? But he didn't. He went negative. She went negative because she was. Listen, how was she ever going to have a turnaround in her life? Without having any, a leader in her life, give her the truth from the Word of God. Open the Scriptures and give her the truth of the Word of God. And he had plenty of it. Elementary. For a Hebrew boy, this is elementary. The Ten Commandments. And as a leader, he would certainly be familiar with a guy like Joshua. My, my, my. You see, as we say, it's not brain surgery here. It's elementary, dear Watson. It's just elementary. So here's point one on Ahab's problems with his marriage. There were so many things wrong in the, from the word of God regarding Ahab, Ahab's marriage to Jezebel that resulted in chaos. It's hard to point out any one or so, but I'm going to point out three. I'm going to point out three in a moment. But the one primary problem they have is role reversal. A simple way to say that, he should be wearing the pants and she should be wearing the skirt. But she's wearing the pants and he's wearing the skirts. They got their role reversal of who's in authority and who's submissive. Oh, yeah, listen to your hearts. Go back and read Ephesians 5. Oh, you say, I know it. I've heard it many times. Eh, I don't know. Who's wearing the pants in your family? Well, I let him wear them sometimes. Yeah, I know. You see, that's role reversal, and it's a killer to marriage because God set up divine institutions to operate a certain way. Authority, the chain of command, authority and submission. Every, all five, all five divine institutions run off that same chain of command. There's an authority and a submission role. When those roles get reversed, chaos comes out. Chaos. So one of the problems, that's one of them. That chain of command is important. You should read 1 Corinthians 13, 3, 8 through 11. And is based on, listen, that's based on Genesis 2, 18 through 25, the first marriage. The divine institution of marriage, it's instituted in Genesis 2, 18 through 25. And Paul is working off from that system in 1 Corinthians 11. In 1 Timothy 2, he's working off that same system. When the divine chain of command gets out of order, the marriage gets out of divine order. When the chain of divine order gets, when the chain of command of divine order gets out of order, the marriage is out of order. This is true in every divine institution. Now, let me tell you, evil is the opposite. Evil is the opposite of growth in the Word of God. Evil, you can grow in evil. It's chaos. Grow in the word of God. It's a good life. It's a good life. All divine institutions are going to reach their maximum potential under the divine system. Never, never reach the potential under the cosmic system. They can operate under the cosmic system, but not at max level. They don't have God. They have an institution that's divine. But they need the God of the institution that's divine. And so you, you need to be aware of that. Now, listen, let me show you something. First, it's not on your paper. 
1 Thessalonians 5.23. It tells you how God made human existence. How he, how he made the components of human existence. Human existence is of three parts. A body, a soul, and a spirit. There's two times that you see this thing come together. One is, phys is, is physical birth, and the other is spiritual death. At, at physical birth, the body, the soul, and the spirit are joined together. The, the spirit goes into the, the body. The spirit goes into the body and the soul. Just like God made, the, made man from the earth and breathed into his nostrils, the soul and the spirit. So we have the body, and God breathes into that body with birth, where the child is now becomes in its own existence, the soul and the spirit. It, the child becomes alive. I mean, every medical person in the world knows that. On the back side of it, at death, you have the opposite. The body goes back to the dust of the earth. The soul goes to heaven or hell, and the spirit returns to the Father who gave it. Nishimai Haim, the breath of God. And now we're going to come into a new existence with a new body, a born-again soul, and a spirit that lives in another dimension that you and I can't possibly understand. Even Paul, when he got a glimpse of it, was not permitted to talk about it in 2 Corinthians 12. So, here's what happens. When you fill your soul with evil, it's reflected to your spirit in your body. It's reflected through it. When you put the word of God and the, his grace in your soul, it's reflected through your spirit and through your body. I mean, how many times you read Proverbs and said, you know, the mental attitude sins, they, they rot your body, body and bones, right? But the word of God brings health, brings joy. I mean, you can't imagine the witness your life has in a hospital when you have these kind of confidences. I met with a team of kidney people. And they went through their whole thing. Well, you know, I said, look, 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 wait. We can cut to the chase on this deal. Let me just explain my position and my family's position, and then let's go from there. They said, well, okay, Mr. Ademar. It's taken me seven days to get him to pronounce my name right. But that's all right. That's, that's my duty to my family. We're all, listen, my wife, when she dies, no doubt about it, she's going to heaven. That's taken care of. We've got that deal sealed. I believe that when I, about my death, my wife believes it about her death, my children believe it about their death. As a family, we're okay. What we want out of this exercise in this hospital is quality of life. And they said, well, okay. All this other stuff we're going to talk about, we're going to not talk about it then. I said, good. Because if you're talking about extended life, it's not a quality. We're not interested in it. Because the greatest quality of life, we want to give her the best we can on this end because our Heavenly Father will give it to her on the other end. And we want that transition. We want her to go from good to good. It's amazing. One of the doctors, uh, of the, the ones that were standing there, the young guy said, I... Can I make a comment? And there, the other guys looked at him. And I went, you sure can. He said, I just went through this exercise with my grandmother. And we made all the same decisions. And I wouldn't have changed a thing about it. And, and he looked at me, had that grin like, let's, let's talk the talk. So you never know, do you? 
You tell people the truth, and the truth set them free. You tell people the truth. Right? You don't give them what they want to hear. You give them what they need to hear. Now you're an ambassador for Christ. And it's interesting how others, other ambassadors will step forward when they feel they have the privilege and the platform to do it. Well, Ahab, come on, Ahab, step up to the plate and, and be honorable. Be honorable. So listen, men, if you're not married, <laughs> looks like probably everybody is, but maybe one, I don't know, one or two. Men, so I'm talking apparently to somebody on the Internet. Don't marry someone you can't lead. It's either the wrong person or the wrong timing. Women, don't marry someone you can't submit to lead you. Don't do it. Now, I mean, don't go in it. I can't tell you how many couples think they can change the other one as soon as they get them in bed. Oh, I mean in marriage. What was I saying? Oh, yeah, I can change him. Yeah, yeah, that's Jezebel's theory. But she has to have somebody that wears a skirt. Point number two. Let me mention three big un uncorrected mistakes that Ahab made. Say, it's one thing to marry wrong. It's another thing to stay that way. Divorce won't solve your problem. <laughs> you carry it with you. Oh, if I just had a different wife. Oh, if I had a different job. If I had a different house. If I had a different car. If I had a different, oh, I dare, damn, oh, my, my, my. <laughs> yeah, how'd that work out? How, how has that worked out in your life? So Ahab has, has made some mistakes, and they're uncorrected. For example, the first mistake was he willingly married an unbeliever. He willfully married an unbeliever. Now, he had his reasons. It was a political marriage. There's no good reason. There is no good reason to marry an unbeliever. So I wrote scriptures down for you because I need to tell you the truth and you need to read it because I'm not going to quote it for you. 1 Corinthians 7, 39 and 40 and the ninth chapter, verse 5, and you should write this one down. I didn't put it on your paper, but you should write it. 1 Corinthians 7, 16. A believer should marry a believer. A second mistake that Ahab made was he allowed unauthorized authority in from his marriage to the nation. Now he's got a double reversal, role reversal. He's allowing Jezebel unauthorized authority in a nation. She established a state religion of idolatry. You know why? She wears the pants and he wears the skirt. I wanted to call my lesson that, but I was afraid it wouldn't look good on the billboard out front. We have Ephesians 5, 22 through 33 for our reference. And here's the third one. Now, you're going to have to write a little, so get you a pencil. The third mistake he made that he left uncorrected was based on their struggles in four basic marital areas. And you better get these down. If you're married, these are four areas you better win in. Four areas you better win in. And you can't wear the pants in one and the skirt in another. Nah, 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 nah. The, the gal's got to wear the skirt and the guy's got to wear the pants. 
In other words, one's got to have authority and one's got to have submission. You've got to do it properly. I'm not talking about muscle. I'm talking about spiritual leadership. Now watch this. I want you to open your Bibles. I want you to go to 2 Corinthians, the 6th chapter, 14 through 16. I want you to go there, and I want you to write a little bit. Because I really think it's important. If I don't get anything else done today, I want to get this done. This is killing us in the church. It shouldn't, but it's killing us. Here is the model of a Christian marriage. There are four aspects of a Christian marriage that are dynamite. 6.14. Now God has not only raised the Lord, but he will also raise up through his power. Now, I, have second, I want 2 Corinthians. I knew that wasn't working right. 2 Corinthians. It sounded good, though. I had the body. 2 Corinthians 6, 14. Do not be, look up. Here's a commandment. Do not be bound together with an unbeliever. Now, he's going to tell you why. Now, this is what's important. Here's the reasons you don't be bound. But listen, if you are bound, right, if you are bound, here are the four areas that you should be bound together in in your marriage. Do you understand that? <laughs> Don't be bound to unbelievers. Be bound to believers, and here's how it works. And here's why. And here's why. Now watch this. Here's number one. Put this on your paper. Partnership. Number two, fellowship. Number three, I'm in verse 15. Harmony, I'm, I'm reading now the New American Standard. And in verse 16, agreement. Those four areas. Now get those four areas. Because this is what it's about. This is why Christian marriage championed the divine institution of marriage. They champion it. But you've got to win it in four areas. You've got to win it in partnership, in fellowship, in harmony, and in agreement. Now, one day, I have taught this before. I'll come back and I'll teach this in great detail to you. I'm just giving you a summary. Now, I want you to, watch, I want to go back to each one of them. I want to show you. I want to show you something. Let's go back to verse 14. Partnership. Now, watch. He's asking a question. What partnership has righteousness and lawlessness. So under partnership, under partnership, right, plus R versus lawlessness. You can put a minus L if you want to. Lawlessness. You know what the answer would be? None. Right? None. None. Now he goes to verse 15, or, or verse 14. He says, what fellowship has light versus darkness? So what's the answer? Nothing. No fellowship. No partnership. No leadership. Or no fellowship. Now verse 15. What harmony has Christ with Biela? Belel. Belel is a word for Satan dealing with the object of worship. Let me give you an idea of the difference of these two. In Matthew, the fourth chapter, 1 through 11, the great temptation of Jesus in the wilderness, he's tempted by Satan, and he's tempted over the idea of worship. Right? Well, when you read it, just Matthew... And that's the difference. True worship comes through Christ of God. No worship comes through Satan of God. He's the arch enemy of it. So, what harmony? Zero. 
Then, then he goes, he goes uh, to agreement. Watch, watch the contrast again. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? The temple of God with idols. Right? Now what you got, look, in that one, what you got is the source of worship. You realize your body is the temple of God, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, 20, for what reason? You have, you have the ability to worship all times, all places, no matter what. You can be sitting on to John and have worship with God. I know that's kind of probably crude on Sunday morning, but I'm trying to make a point. Not to be crude, just trying to make a point. The temple of God is where the Holy Spirit dwells your entire life. It's a place of worship. It's the naos. And it's a place of worship because of the blood of Christ. Now, he set up the four. Now, if you're a believer married to a believer, look at your side. Your side, your side would be righteous, light, Christ, temple of God. Agreed? And notice what, what's attached to it. For example, the temple of God. What's, what's, what is it? Agreement. Notice what's attached to these each of the four areas. That's what's important. And, and what's he talking about? He's talking about marriage. Don't be bound to an unbeliever. He's talking about marriage on one hand. He could be talking about business partnerships. I just used it for marriage. He could be talking about any of the divine institutional ideas. Now watch this. Now I'm in verse, um, I'm in the last half of verse 16. And he get, watch this. The I wills are the promises. Watch these promises now. This is the payoff. See, I love God's promises. I love his promises because there's where the blessings are. There's where the blessings are, man. It's where the blessings are. Who doesn't want blessings? My goodness. Watch this. These four areas, let's get them lined up, he says. Let's get them lined up. Righteousness, light, right? Let's get them lined up. Temple of God. Christ, temple of God. Let's get them lined up. This is what he says. When you get them lined up, here's what I do. I will dwell in them, number one, and I will walk among them. That's two things. I will dwell in them, and I will walk among them. Third, the third I will. I will be their God. They shall be my people. Then he stops, and he gives us a therefore, which takes in everything we've set up to now. Don't be bound to an unbeliever. Be bound to a believer, because here is, here is how God designed it, the four areas that God designed it. And here's what God is promising. Therefore, come out from among their midst and be separated, saith the Lord. And do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you. See, that's what he wants out of Ahab and Israel right now. And the, how do you get cleansed? By the blood of Christ. First, you get cleansed by, listen to me now. First, you get cleansed by the blood of Christ, and then you get cleansed by the word of God. For those of us that have been cleansed by the blood of Christ and are in continuous state of being cleansed by the blood of Christ through 1 John 1, 9, it is all about being cleansed by the word of God, Ephesians 5, 25. So now we have, I have one, two, three. Now I have a fourth, I will, I will what? Welcome you. And here's how he's going to welcome you. 
The fifth, I will. I will be a father to you, and you shall be a son and daughter to me. Thus speaks the Lord Almighty. Isn't that wonderful? Is that not wonderful? My, 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 that's wonderful. My, my, my. Ahab has given Jezebel unauthorized authority to establish a state-supported, funded, idolatrous religion that stands in opposition to worship of God. It has brought, around, brought about a drought crisis to the nation in order to awaken it spiritually for a spiritual reformation away from idolatry and back to the worship of the true and only God. Baal worship has become a substitute in the divine agency of the priest nation to the gospel, the grace gospel of Jesus Christ. Ahab has allowed his wife to establish Baal worship as a substitute for the divine agency custodianship of the word of God and evangelism and it's supposed to be corrected now. God is calling for a cleansing, a reformation. Religion, such as Baal worship, is conformity to the world system of the worship of Satan. We call it cosmos diabolicus. The first recorded example of it is given in Genesis 4, 1 through 11. With Cain and Abel, you have it. On the one hand, you would have the church. On the other hand, you have religion. Religion raised up and killed Abel. There you have it. 1 John, 5, 1 John 3, 12. Jezebel is a classic example of the danger of a state a state-supported religion that forbids the freedom of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are in trouble in America. We are in great trouble in America because there is a vicious attack against Christianity because the gospel of Jesus Christ has the power to change human hearts. It is the only power in the world that can change a human heart. And buddy, we're testimony of that. Your life should be a testimony of it. Mine is. My, my, my. You should read Acts 26 when Paul laid it out before King Agrippa. Never be, never be apologetic to sharing the truth of Jesus Christ to people who need to hear it. Baal worship shows why religion is the arch enemy of God and of the grace gospel of Christ and spiritual freedom like Galatians 5, 1 and 13. Ahab has allowed his queen wife, foreign queen wife, to become the face and the platform of idolatrous worship in the priest nation of Israel. From her position as a foreign queen wife, Abraham has allowed this woman to murder all the prophets of God with the exception of a hundred who were hid by Obadiah including Elijah, until his time to be revealed as a prophet to Israel. Now this woman is using this same unlawful authority in an attempt to minimize his national victory and influence from the contest win at Mount Carmel, winner take all. What this woman does not realize is that it was the Lord God of Israel who has won the contest from Baal. Unfortunately, Elijah has missed this fact as well as he's on the run. Now he has allowed himself to be imitated by Jezebel's non-authority in the plan of God. She is a no threat to him in the plan of God any more than Goliath was to David. Don't run when nobody's chasing She was a no threat to this man, and he allowed her to be. He allowed her to be. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your love, mercy, and grace. I pray, Father, those who are attending with us, if they get nothing else, get this. 
Jesus Christ came to this earth to die on a cross for our sins. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin, Adam, and so it passed upon all men. But faithful was he to the word of God, who went to the cross on, on, on behalf of all of mankind, so that they might be saved by the grace of God through faith, and not of themselves, it is a gift of God, saved by the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ to everyone who will believe. It is my plea today, Father, before the audience on the internet as well as this congregation, that we would be ambassadors of the truth. Don't tell people what they want to hear. Tell them what they need to hear that might release them from the bondage of life, uh, the bondage of death into life. We thank you, Father, for this opportunity and the freedom we have today in America to preach the truth of God to those who have ears to hear. In Jesus' name, amen.